Hello. Today I want to talk about insulin resistance and its correlation and possible causation of hypertension. So if you are struggling with hypertension and nothing seems to be working, maybe we need to look through the lens of insulin resistance. So I'm going to go over a few mechanisms that will highlight how insulin resistance can directly cause hypertension. And if you have any questions, please feel free to comment below. And if you are not a subscriber, please subscribe and wherever platform that you're listening from. Okay, so let me pull up my notes. Okay, so first of all, <clears throat> it's important to understand insulin resistance is where the body doesn't utilize insulin very well. And there's a few different mechanisms that cause this. I have an entire workshop if you'd like to learn more about it at the drmarvis.com website. But today we're going to specifically focus in on hypertension or high blood pressure. And when I'm talking about high blood pressure, this is typically where that top number is above 120 and the bottom number is over 80 on a consistent basis. Most people, if you really want to see optimal, really healthy blood pressures, we're talking consistently probably 110 to 115 and definitely in the lower 70s or even 60s for that bottom number. All right. So number one, insulin resistance can... Um, impair nitric oxide production. So insulin helps to regulate the dilation of blood vessels by stimulating the production of nitric oxide. And that's a molecule that relaxes your blood vessels and reduces blood pressure. <clears throat> Again, also in insulin resistance, when this happens, the mechanism is actually impaired and that leads to decreased nitric oxide availability and consequently reduce blood vessel dilation or opening, right? Relaxing of the blood vessels. And then that can recall what we call vascular resistance and higher blood pressure. So it's important to understand blood pressure is actually measuring the force that's being exerted from the inside of your arteries. So the top number is when the heart is beating, right? And it's contracting, pushing out the blood there's a resistance that's occurring. Imagine if you're blowing up one of those long skinny balloons or you're turning water on a hose, there's gonna be some resistance because it's not like the water can just go wherever or the air can just go, right? There's a lot more work to go blowing up a balloon versus just blowing. So that's the thing we wanna talk about is what is that force that's being exerted on the inside of those arteries. So as the heart's contracting, you'll see that top number. And as the heart's relaxing in between beats and refilling, getting ready for the next contraction, that is the force of the bottom number that we're measuring. So vascular resistance is how tight or how stiff is that resistance? So imagine if you have a real pliable blood vessel and it's pumping, it's easy. You know, the blood vessel goes, wee, it's happy. It's pliable like when you were a baby um, versus when it's hard and there's heart disease and you know hardening of the arteries it makes it really hard to pump um, into the the blood vessel so then you get a stiffening right so there's a stiffening of that and that can cause some problems so when you don't have nitric oxide there's less of it there's more resistance because the blood vessels are more stiff or smaller let's say smaller uh, if you have a smaller circle, there, there you go. If you have a smaller circumference, right? That is actually going to be more uh, difficult to pump that um, blood into. So you get increased resistance. Okay. That's number one. Number two, you get sympathetic nervous system activation. Okay. What does that mean? So insulin resistance is associated with increased sympathetic nervous system activity. And then this heightened activity can cause an increased heart rate, right? And what we call vasoconstriction. Um, that's the narrowing of the blood vessels, both of which contribute to elevated blood pressure. So that kind of goes back to what I was talking about. If you have a smaller circumference or a smaller hole, there's going to be more resistance. It's um, a little bit stiffer. So that's the second way um, insulin resistance can actually increase high blood pressure. Okay, sodium retention and fluid balance. So insulin influences the kidney's ability to handle sodium. And in the state of insulin resistance, there's often an increase in sodium reabsorption by the kidneys, leading to fluid retention, right? So the, the, where the sodium goes, the water flows, and increased blood volume and higher blood pressure. So that's what we tell people who 
have hypopressure to avoid sodium. Now, some people are more sodium sensitive than others, but at the same time, remember where if you ever eaten something that's really salty and you felt kind of bloated or you feel like your hands feel a little bit mm, stiff because there's a lot of fluid, you feel just, eh, that's what we're talking about because that's what's happening. The body is trying to adjust and deal with all the sodium. <clears throat> Next is inflammation and endothelial dysfunction. So insulin resistance is often accompanied by low grade inflammation throughout the body. And there's a host of reasons why it's occurring. But right now we're talking in generalities. You know, chronic inflammation can damage that endothelium inside of those arteries. Um, it's the inner lining of your blood vessels and impairs function, which we've already talked about, about the nitric oxide. So endothelial dysfunction is really a key factor in the development of hypertension as it disrupts the normal regulation of vasodilation and vasoconstriction. Next is obesity and adipokine, adipokine um, imbalance. So what are adipokines? These are hormones released by the fat, which you can think of as an organ in of a sense, right? So your, your subcutaneous fat or the fat where your body stores its fat didn't come out right. Where the body stores fat, that's your subcutaneous fat. It's it's a living thing, right? It responds to hormones and stresses and chemical messengers and all these things. It has a blood supply and it in and of itself releases certain hormones. So when insulin resistance is closely related to obesity, right, which is that major factor for hypertension in and of itself, the adipose tissue in obesity secretes things, like I said, as adipokines. And some of these, such as leptin, which you may have heard about, can increase blood pressure, believe it or not, while a reduction in what we call adiponectin, um, which is common in obesity, is associated with impaired vasodilation. So what's happening is you have obesity and you're outstripping your natural capacity to store fat in the subcutaneous area. Now we start storing fat in the visceral organs, around the visceral organs, in the liver, in the muscle. That causes a state of inflammation. And again, there's several mechanisms, which I go into depth um, in the workshop. And I'm also about to launch <clears throat> an insulin resistance uh, course and how to lose weight because it's if you can affect insulin resistance, you can absolutely help many chronic diseases, but in the dish, definitely help with your weight loss. But anyway, the hormones can shift when we're at a certain point with our weight. <clears throat> And there's also next is insulin induced vascular changes, right? So while insulin promotes vasodilation, typically states of insulin resistance, there can be an imbalance of those signaling pathways leading to kind of the vascular changes that favor that constriction, right? That narrowing of the hole or the blood vessel. And then finally, it's the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. It's fancy, fancy uh, words. I'll just call it the RAS, right? R A A S, RAS activation. So insulin can stimulate RAS, which it's a hormone system that regulates blood pressure and fluid balance. So activation of the system kind of leads to the vasoconstriction, sodium retention, and then that contributes to your hypertension. So really, there's multiple things here that are are similar or related, or you know, when one's activated, the other one as well. So it's kind of a complicated picture. But at the end of the day, if we look through the framework of insulin resistance, that's where we can really see some changes because so many things that we talk about, <clears throat> like, oh, okay, we have high cholesterol. Oh, we have inflammation. We have diabetes. We have hypertension. So many of these things at the root, one of the mechanisms, many of these things are multifactorial. Cardiovascular disease has multiple things that can cause it, as does hypertension diabetes. But as far as we look, there are multiple things that can cause diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes or type 1. But anyway, get sidetracked. I'm not trying to get deep into that. But right now, if you think about the insulin resistance piece, it really is a big major player in multiple chronic diseases. And each one and of themselves can be very complicated to understand. But if we look at just the framework, like I said, of insulin resistance, which is pretty easy to diagnose and monitor. There's a few tools to do that. There's some lab work that you can do. And there's also a CGM, which we can monitor glucose because your glucose levels speak a lot to it. 
especially in the light of insulin resistance. First, you have to say, do I have insulin resistance? And then a CGM, something like that can actually become very useful. So um, I have a glucose mastermind class and we, I prescribe CGMs and we sit and we talk about, you know, educating what insulin resistance is, and especially in the light of their current situation, they get their data and feedback and they start making some changes, things that can actually reverse insulin resistance. And that's where they start seeing magic happens. And in my next glucose mastermind, I'm also going to be offering uh, certain labs. So I'll be ordering them um, if someone wants to, and it'll all be covered in the course would be the price would be covered would be lipid panel, uh, fasting glucose, a fasting insulin. And then we can take those things and actually calculate what your insulin resistance score is and your risk factors. So, oh, and an A1C. That was the, those are the four tests. So yeah, we can do that before and after, after three months of the program. So that's exciting. And really just trying to make it easier for you can kind of see, well, where am I going, right? I've been doing this, let's say, let's say you start incorporating healthy lifestyle things and you're just, you're seeing some things improve, but you're like, you would just really kind of like to see almost one number improve, right? I think insulin resistance, if you start with insulin resistance in the beginning and you are insulin resistant, you can see and use that as a monitor as to things that you're doing, even more so than the scale, um, and some other things, uh, numbers, you know, especially like things like the A1C will certainly improve, but it takes a while. I think insulin resistance you see happen pretty quick. You start seeing things really move in the right direction. Um, anyway, lots to it. I hope that was helpful, but just to correlate again, you get impaired nitric oxide production, sympathetic nervous system activation, sodium retention and fluid imbalance, and then inflammation and endothelial dysfunction, obesity, and then the hormone imbalance, insulin-induced vascular changes, and then the RAS activation. So, um, yeah, it's very complicated in the interplay, but it's once you understand it, it's actually pretty straightforward in the sense of seeing where you are and what you're doing because you're you're aware of things. And I think that's the piece here is this education and then act upon that education and see how you're doing over time. So hope that was helpful. And I wanted to start something new with the end of every live. I want to <clears throat> wish you uh, joy, love, and peace in your life on a daily basis, because I don't think there's enough messages out there for that. So for you, whoever's listening, wherever this is, I am sending you love, joy, and peace in May your in your day and your week and on going forever. So I just wanted to share that with you. And I hope you have the rest of your day is lovely as well. So we'll be back tomorrow. Have a great one. And don't forget to please subscribe and um, we'll see you next time.